Hello, and welcome to episode 9 of The Dark Money Files, in which we shine a light into a murky world. I'm Ray Blake, and with me is my co-host, friend and business partner, Graham Barrow. Hello, Graham. Hi, Ray. And what have we got in store for our listeners this week, Graham? Well, Ray, we're heading towards the end of our review of the BMH report into Danske Bank in Estonia. But I'd, I'd have to say we've arrived as much by luck as judgment at a point in the review which is just incredibly pertinent, given the, the current round of breaking news. Um, but before we do, I think you've got an update from our request for information in episode eight. Yes, you mentioned that in January 2010, there was a report in the Estonian media linking Danske Bank to a specific alleged money laundering scheme but we were unable to find it online. Well, thanks to the power and reach of the Dark Money Files, one of our listeners came forward with links to the story. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, Graham, we don't have time to do the story justice at the moment, but it was a sizeable money laundering scheme amounting to 15 billion Estonian crowns, which at the time was the equivalent of around £1 billion or around $1.4 billion. Wow. Well, that was... Very helpful of our listener, and let's hope we have an opportunity to come back and do that story justice at some point in the future. Yep, I think we definitely should. Now, where were we? Um, Well, we were going to look at events at Danske from 2011 onwards, and this was the time that senior managers started to become aware of the um, problems they faced with the non-resident portfolio and start to take action, or not, as the case may be. (laughs) Uh, Graham, tell me I'm leaping to unwarranted conclusions here, but that sounds like it could have echoes of recent events at Swedbank and beyond. Ray, I agree, and I think the point here should be for any senior managers listening to this podcast to ask themselves a few questions. Like, do we have a similar problem? Yes, and if we do, how big is it? And how do we find out? And then how will we manage the communications? Well, Swedbank has been an object lesson in how not to do it, hasn't it? Uh, yes, and I think we'll find that Danske didn't always make particularly good choices either. Graham, you asked me to look at the timeline between 2011 and 2014, and the first thing I noticed is just how much happened in that period. Uh, Ray, you're right, and in all honesty, and for the sake of our listeners' sanity, um, I think it's neither wise nor helpful to go through the entire timeline in detail. Uh, if anyone is interested, it runs from page 43 to page 63 in the BNH report. So we're going to pick out some of our highlights then. Yes. So what was the first thing that caught your eye? It would have to be that following fairly critical reviews from the Estonian and Danish FSAs during 2013, along with the termination of one of the bank's correspondent relationships, as well as a less favourable internal audit report, the bank commissioned a review of the non-resident portfolio. Oh, when was that? In the last quarter of 2013. Okay, and what was the gist of that review? The first sentence that attracted my attention was early on in the B&H report of the review. Oh, what did that say? It said that the review brought, quote, new information to group. Oh, what was that? Firstly, that business banking had noted that, quote, over normal profit is usually a warning sign, superior service or not... I'm sorry, is that being is that being held up as new information? Uh, well, that's exactly how it reads in the report, yes. But, you know, seasoned bankers shouldn't be surprised at the idea that people who are willing to pay over the odds might have an ulterior motive for being quite so acquiescent. Hmm. Yes, I, I agree. So, but, well, maybe there was something that followed which qualified the sentence to be reported as new information. Well, it goes on to say that, quotes the lack of price sensitivity with some customers is due to other factors than good service. <laughs> oh, I'm still not convinced that should be regarded as new, especially as the non-resident portfolio had been outperforming just about everywhere else for at least the past four years. Oh, I agree. Um, also, Group Compliance and AML stated that, quotes, the business volume with non-resident customers in Estonia was larger than expected. <laughs> New. I mean, again, it's been running at about the same level as the entire Estonian GDP. It was at that time and it had been for some years previously. I'm not sure it would take a genius to work that out. 
Um, I agree again. Uh, and then it does get a bit more interesting. Oh. Yes, as it mentions, almost for the first time, the presence of intermediaries in the form of, quotes, non-regulated entities. Oh. oh, what does it say? It says that they constituted a small group of customers in the non-resident portfolio who held accounts for the purpose of facilitating transactions with their own end customers outside the branch. OK, so they were effectively using Danske Bank to put through transactions on behalf of customers that Danske itself had no sight of. Exactly. They would have to rely on the intermediaries themselves doing proper due diligence on their clients to ensure they weren't handling dark money or laundering on their behalf. Uh, and the fact that they weren't regulated meant that they were under no legal or regulatory requirement to do so, I presume. Well, exactly, which is a bit of a problem for Danske Bank. Uh, yeah, just a bit. It then goes on to quote from a memo which was circulated to the branch's executive committee outlining the way bonds were used within the branch to move money out of Russia. And as I would have it, Ray, I have what is either a copy of that memo or at least an earlier draft of it. Oh, why do you think it might be an earlier draft? Uh, because there are a couple of differences from what is quoted in the B&H report that makes me think it was subject to further editing and therefore needs to be treated a little bit carefully. Oh, this is quite a sensitive document, Graham. Where did it come from? Uh, Ray, I trust you more than any other friend I have, and, and as it's just you and me chatting, obviously it wouldn't matter too much, but I would still have to kill you if I told you, and, and I, I don't want to do that. Well, fair enough. I don't want you to do that either, Graham. Um, can you talk a bit more about the memo, though? Yeah, so, so I have been given permission to quote from it. Um, it's a fairly detailed explanation of the role of the financial intermediaries and bond trading. Um, one of the first discrepancies is that my copy talks about nine customers in the intermediary segment, and the version quoted by B&H talks about ten. But um, that's part of the memo, is otherwise identical in every respect. OK. But then the report goes on to mention an earlier draft which states in respect of the bond trade, in quotes, and therefore potentially this solution could be used for money laundering, end quote. And that's not in the version I have, so I can, I can only assume that mine was a later draft, but maybe not the final one. Hmm, that's interesting. Anything else in the memo we can talk about? Oh yeah, um, the memo openly talks about how profitable the bond trades were, with an estimated income for 2013 set at around 10 million euro. Nice. Yeah, and it goes to great pains to talk about the robust controls it has it in place to mitigate the risks, which we'll talk about in a minute. But there is one issue that threads its way throughout the memo. Oh? Yeah, alongside the expressions of confidence in the controls are other, other less comforting statements like, quotes, the solution is likely to be temporary as at some point regulations in Russia are likely to change so as to bring this solution within existing currency control regulations, end quote. Which suggests that even though the bond trading may have been legal, it was nevertheless being used in a way that at the very least was ethically doubtful and, and, and the suggestion is that it was only technically legal. Yes. Um, the memo goes on to say that they do not accept new intermediary customers and that they expect the number to decline naturally over time. But then, if they had good controls in place and were happy to accept this business, why would they not accept more or replace any that left? I mean, after all, it was highly profitable. Agreed. Um, the, the two elements just don't chime well together, do they? And in fact, it does get worse because having extolled the virtues of the bond solution against using traditional currency payments through a Russian bank, which to be fair are significant, and emphasised the robust controls, which we'll come to in a minute, the very last sentence rather, well at least in my view, spoils it. Why? What does it say? Well, I'll, I'll quote. Last sentence. Quote, additionally, we ensure we do not come under particular scrutiny or become particularly visible by controlling the volume of bond transactions. Oh, I mean, that, that's not a ringing endorsement of the process, Graham, is it? 
No, Ray, I, I've thought about that sentence a lot and, and I just can't come up with a plausible reason for including it other than the fact that they must have known the bond trades wouldn't have done well under close scrutiny and deliberately avoided that situation from happening. Mm. So what were these controls? Well, the account managers typically met with the intermediaries uh, once a quarter rather than once a year. <laughs> OK, great. Yeah. Um, the bank held details of the end clients on whose behalf the payment was made. The memo said that this meant they could cross-check names and weed out any problems. What, like all those UK LLPs with legal entity designated members in offshore secrecy locations, you mean? Uh, um, the, the memo <laughs> goes on to say that the bank could request further details of the client if needed. But failed to mention whether they actually did so, I'm guessing. Uh, correct. Although, although it also says that they can meet with end clients in order to get greater assurance and had done so in a number of cases. Well, call me cynical, Graham, but I don't see how meeting with the end clients provides any greater assurance than having their names on the due diligence. Um, any money launderer worth their salt would be able to conjure up some likely looking people on request. The whole point of enhanced due diligence is to obtain independent verification. None of that sounds remotely independent. No, um, Ray, there's more. Oh, God, go on. Well, the, the bank obtained documentation for all payments from the intermediary, which largely meant underlying invoices and purchase contracts. And these were reviewed on a sample basis to ensure that the invoice related to bona fide goods and services. But that's the wrong way round. We should be less concerned with what the money's being used for and more concerned with where the money's come from. After all, it's a perfectly good way of laundering dirty money if you use it to buy highly desirable consumer goods and sell them on. That's just a form of trade-based money laundering. It's the source of the funds we should be concerned about, not the destination. It gets worse, Ray. I'm not sure I can take much more, Graham. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the memo goes on to state that the bank monitors the recipients of the payments and that in many cases they are well-known companies. Oh, for goodness sake, of course they're well-known companies. That's called integration. It's exactly what you want to achieve. On the other hand, if you haven't got a Scooby where your intermediary's client's money has come from in the first place, none of that's worth a jot. No, but it looks good on paper. Well, clearly, and none of that found its way into the report, did it? No, maybe they thought it was just a bit too complicated. Maybe. Well, either way, picking up from the B&H report, that memo clearly informed the subsequent presentation, which was at pains to point out how profitable the business was and that there were resilient KYC and AML <laughs> procedures in place. <sighs> Notwithstanding that, it also stated that the intermediary business will be subject to, quotes, a runoff, quotes. Oh, OK. Uh, so what happened then? On, on the 23rd of October 2013, there was a business banking performance review meeting with three members of the executive board and the CEO present. Oh, OK, so there's no hiding from accountability there then? No, and some decisions were taken. Oh, which were? that there was an acknowledgement that Danske Bank was out of alignment with its peers on this point and that the portfolio needed to be reviewed and potentially reduced. Oh, OK, that's a bit more positive. Uh, what happened next? The member of the executive board quoted, and we don't know who, um, agreed to hold a further meeting when business banking had finalised its conclusions. Excellent. What happened? An action point for business banking was added to the minutes to this effect with a deadline of November 2013. And? B and H were unable to find any information about a follow-up. What? Yeah, that's it. That's it. Blimey. But there's more. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Business Banking forwarded more material on the review to three members of the Executive Board on the 29th of November and the 13th of December 2013. And at least two of them also received the bond memo that you've got a copy of. However, B&H were unable to find whether this material was shared with the CEO. Well, that's not painting a picture of robust oversight, is it? No, it isn't, Graham. And there's one interesting corollary in light of what you've just said about there being tight control of the bond sales. At a Baltic executive meeting, 
On 15th of August 2013, a rapid increase in bond sales was pointed to. This caused the production of four specific proposals, including a compliance review and greater oversight. They also set up a working group looking into intermediaries, which received weekly reports and met on a monthly basis. But hold on. This was all happening at the same time as that memo was being authored, saying that they kept a tight control on the level of bond sales, and it was all fine anyway. Hmm, yes. And while it may be coincidental, the very next element of the B&H report talks about the whistleblower filing a report concerning the non-resident portfolio. And this was followed over the coming months with further allegations. Now, I know there's a lot in the whistleblower statement because I've just been back and had a look and it deserves, I think, an episode all to itself. So can we park that for a moment while we finish off our look at the activity in branch over that time period? That's a good idea. Um, What we can say for certain is that the whistleblower reports went to a member of the executive board, as well as employees from Baltic Banking, Group Compliance and AML, and Internal Audit. We also know that it triggered an investigation conducted by Group Internal Audit using employees from outside the Estonian branch. Action at last! Yup. In a letter of the 13th of January 2014, Audit confirmed at least some of the allegations made by the whistleblower, one of which was that ongoing monitoring was conducted manually by account managers who were responsible for so many customers it was impossible to do it in an effective and efficient manner. Well, that's pretty damning. Well, you'd think so, except that the letter also states, quotes... Based on the work performed, we have not identified any areas that need immediate reporting to the FSA, quotes. What? I'd have been on the phone to them instantly. I mean, you've got a turnover equal to your entire country's GDP, which is effectively unmonitored, and it's not deemed reportable. In early 2014, when these sorts of things following the HSBC debacle had become front-page news, that's astonishing. Well, um, from there, they did decide to do an on-site visit. Well, that previous report was produced from working remotely. (laughs) So it would seem. Astonishing. Um, What did the on-site visit produce? They were given your memo on the bond sales for a start. Hadn't they seen it before? Well, apparently not. Uh, It had an effect, though. They sent draft conclusions to two members of the executive board and the CEO, which included the bomb memo and the observation that, quotes, we cannot identify the actual source of funds or beneficial owners, quotes. Hmm. And the reason confirmed to them in the hearing of all three auditors was that, quotes, it could cause problems for clients if Russian authorities request information. Oh, my word. Oh, How many times have we heard that before and, frankly, continue to hear that as an excuse? Audit went on to state that, quotes, the branch had entered into highly profitable agreements with a range of Russian intermediaries where the underlying clients are unknown, quotes. <laughs> and they concluded by recommending, quotes, a full independent review of all non-resident customers, quotes. Hurrah! Someone appears to have got it at last. Uh, yes, at last, as you say. Um, the B&H report also makes clear that the reaction to that 2014 report by at least some of the executive board was pretty direct. One wrote that there was, quote, reason for concern, quotes, strong words. Um, mm-hmm. Another said that at the very least the bond trading had to, quote, be closed down immediately, Quotes. A third wrote to Group Legal to ensure that the case didn't go off track, and the CEO agreed. He said, quotes, You should consider an immediate stop of all new business and a controlled winding down of all existing business. Quotes. Consider? Surely the CEO would have been better advised saying, You must put a stop. Um, anyway, so, so what did happen? Well, they put together a working group. A working group. Oh, yes. Which recommended an immediate cessation of all new business and the winding down of all existing business. Nope. No. Uh, No. Um, Graham, the working group went about its business for most of 2014 before deciding that, with some modifications, 
They were going to carry on serving non-resident customers in Estonia. Whoa. Oh. Uh, sadly, Ray, I think we've just about run out of time. And, and anyway, oh. my, my brain is just scrambled. Um, so I think we should stop there and, and come back next week, unless, uh-huh. of course, some other major story breaks, and find <laughs> out more about what the B&H report tells us about the working group and why it didn't bring an immediate cessation of all new business and what happened next with the non-resident portfolio. What, you mean after three executives and the CEO had instructed it be shut oh, down? Don't, yeah. Don't. <laughs> um, by the way, is it the right moment to remind you that we were supposed to be doing three episodes on the Danske Bank Report, and this is now episode four? Um, this has turned into a Douglas Adams trilogy, hasn't it? Uh, yes, uh, I, I'm aware of that, Ray, but it seems that the closer we look, the more there is to talk about, and I do think we should go wherever the evidence leads us. I agree. Um, And anyway, Graham, as you said at the beginning, this episode is not just about a historical review of what happened at Danska, is it? It's got much more relevance than that. Agreed. You you just can't help thinking that similar events are currently playing out in other boardrooms across the Nordics and, frankly, beyond. Yeah, but you'd also like to think this time around, in the light of what we've learned, the outcomes will be different. Well, given that our Swede Bank special already seems to have accounted for one CEO, sorry about that, <laughs> um, you, you've got to hope that the others start learning soon. Uh, and I suspect once we've aired next week's episode, looking at the, the, the somewhat extraordinary events at Danske during 2014 and early 2015, it will encourage a few more senior executives to do what's right and not what's just easy or least problematic. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Dark Money Files. We hope you enjoyed it. If you would like to listen to future episodes, please subscribe through iTunes, Spotify or your normal podcast provider.